welcome to Stories of Hope. I'm so excited that you said that you would be on and you would share about your journey and and your healing and and your life right now. So I'll just pass it over to you and you can start wherever you want. And as I said, I'll ask you questions, but it's really like the floor is yours. Okay, amazing. Um, So I'll start sort of from the official start, shall I say. Um, So I developed um, an anxiety and panic disorder over four years ago now. Uh, my first panic attack was actually when I was driving, which I think is the same as your experience. Mm-hmm. And I just, wow, I didn't know what was happening. Um, you know, just sort of this intense fear that I was just dying all of a sudden. It was really strange. Um, you know, so when that initially started, it was lots of panic attacks, lots of anxiety attacks. Um complete fear of driving like I couldn't even get in my car for a month never mind think about driving and actually that first sort of um experience of anxiety I did go to a therapist I did talk therapy and actually that seemed to really help um and then it seemed to die down for a year or two And I was still getting the odd panic attack and odd anxiety attack, but I sort of accepted it as, oh, well, I just have anxiety now. This is how I have to live my life. And and then it was last year. It was around, I think, thinking back, the signs were there earlier on, but it didn't really start happening till maybe May last year. And... Um, I was working in a really, sorry, I keep on looking down because I've got my notes down here. I don't want to miss anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was um, working in a not very nice workplace. Um, I was working, I'm still working as a teacher now, but I was working as a teacher then. And I worked with a class with a lot of complicated needs. Um, you know, even the staff had complicated needs. needs. And yeah, it was just a really challenging place to work. And I think overall that just triggered something deep inside of me. And it put me in this next phase of panicking and anxiety, shall I say. So last year, that's when it, you know, really went downhill. Um, Not even sort of just suffering sort of panic attacks, you know, a few days a week which I thought was quite a lot um you know I was just constantly anxious that constant sort of tightness in my stomach I never wanted to eat I couldn't sleep properly the slightest thing would put me in the biggest panic attack and it was just awful um really awful so I actually had to take some time off work because I just ended up having panic attacks at work all the time and I actually couldn't work. Um, And then that's when I, well, I think I'd been following you for a while, but I think that's when I went, right, I'm going to get in touch with you um, and see what your sort of philosophy is around this. And I think I really resonated with you because you said you're a school psychologist and I thought, oh, well, no, I'm not a school psychologist but we both have that experience of children and I, I don't know, it's just something about you that pulled me to your advice. Um, so before I talk about our conversation, some of the symptoms that I had, um, it, yeah, it got, I'll be honest, it got bad. It got really bad. Um, severe DPDR. Um, I had both. So sort of total disconnection from myself. I felt like a robot. Um, the world didn't feel real. It was like a game that I was in, like almost like a simulation. Um, and I'd get like memory zaps. So, you know, I'd just be going about my day, obviously not in the best ways at all. And then my brain would almost have like a memory zap and I'd just forget everything. Like I'd forget my partner's name. I'd forget where I was. And it'd only last five to 10 seconds. But that was really terrifying, really, really terrifying. Um, I think that was the worst sort of symptom I had, to be honest. Um, and then along with that was sort of 
a fear of insanity, a fear of going crazy, a fear of like early onset dementia, thinking, well, if I can't remember things now, I'm definitely getting dementia. Um, loads of existential thoughts, but I think that was with the DPDR, you know, nothing felt real. So I'm completely questioning what reality was. And along with that, just because it was so tough just to go through a normal day, sort of depression came along with it as well. Um, yeah, it was it was the hardest time I've ever been through, definitely. Um, so that was sort of a, an overview of some of the symptoms I had. Um, I could go in more detail, but I think we'll just keep it quite generalised. But yeah, it, it was tough. It was really tough. Um, and then DPDR wasn't really something I could, um, find a lot of information on. And then you were sharing this sort of strange feeling of feeling unattached and feeling weird. Oh my gosh, she's got it. She's had it. And I, the relief I had when you were like, even just the reels you were making, um, or, or around DPD, I was like, oh my God, someone, someone else has it. Someone else has experienced it. Um, so that's when I got in touch with you really. And <laughs> I remember our conversation and I remember thinking, I think thinking, okay, maybe this lady doesn't get it because you went to me and you went, aren't you so lucky that you've been through this really traumatic experience in your workplace? And your body's told you, no, I can't live like this. And you made it so positive that I was going through this experience. And I was thinking, what, what, is, what is she on about? And then you came out with the words of, this is a love letter. This is a love letter from your body telling you to, you know, that you need to look after yourself or whatever it is. But it's just a huge love letter saying, whoa, let's let's slow it down a bit. Um, and I remember finishing the phone call and it was like mixed feelings. I was thinking, I don't know how she can be so positive about something that feels so, so horrible that alters your very belief around existing. Um, but that comment itself, this is a love letter, has definitely stuck with me since our, our first phone call. Um, and I've got it actually, I've got like a mantra um, notes on on my mirror that I just say to myself on the morning um that's more sort of just to uplift my mood and make me feel more positive but that's the second thing on my list is this is a love letter um so yeah that's really really stuck with me what's your first um, one you mind sharing if you're open to hmm? share? what's your first one on your list that if the if you mean on your mantras the if the love letter is the second yeah what's the first if you want to share you don't have to yeah, so actually, it's nothing personal. It's um, so this was something I didn't um, sort of come to till around, I think it was around July time. Um, and actually saying I'm not an anxious person. So that's number one on my list. Um, and you, you know, people might be watching this going, How is she not an anxious person? She said she's had anxiety, panic, DPDR. Of course, she's anxious, um, but I do have, and it's, I'm not just saying this, I do have this internal belief that actually nobody is anxious. Nobody is an anxious person. There is no such thing as being an anxious person. Um, and then that's when your philosophy came in, really, um, that anxiety, I think when you first experience it, it feels like this thing's sort of like stuck onto you it's sort of just attacked you out of nowhere and it's just stuck and you can't get rid of it and a huge part of my recovery is understanding that anxiety just sort of passes through and I almost visualize it a bit like a gray cloud you know just on a rainy day it just sort of sometimes it just comes through and it might be around but then you just have to let it move on um so yeah, I always tell myself I am not an anxious person because at the end of the day, nobody is really. I love yeah, that. Yeah. Um, up to you and you're in telling your story. <laughs> so 
Yeah. Um, so May, so I said, yeah, it was around May time. It got really bad. I got in touch with you. Was it June or July? Might be in July. Early July. I was I was off work at the time. Um, I remember that conversation. And then it was the summer holidays. The summer holidays were very up and down, but because it was my summer holidays from work, being a teacher, I sort of lacked routine in my life. And I don't think that helped at all, to be honest. Um, because I had such low motivation about myself and what I would do, you know, I'd, I'd spend days just sort of dawdling around the house, not really doing anything. Um, so lack of routine sort of put me down another little slope, I should say. And then, <clears throat> was it around August time? Um, I think I messaged, messaged you about quite a personal sort of, experience that I had that would really terrify me and to be honest it's not only till these last this last month that I've sort of been able to get over that panic attack where I got in touch with you because that was really really scary really scary I didn't even question oh I think I'm losing my mind it was I've lost my mind um and it was really really scary so you know, people uh, have different opinions around medication, but I did go to the doctors and I went on beta blockers for a month and a half, two months, just to help with some of the anxious symptoms because I think my body got in such a state of panic and anxiety that it was really struggling to almost like self-regulate. Um, I found them really helpful, whereas before I was very anti-medication. And I know some people think, oh, well, I can't, you know, I have to take med medication to get better. And I don't think that's true. I think everyone is completely individual. Some people prefer something just to maybe take the ease off it. Um, and some people like to face it full on. You know, that's that's their own opinion, really. Um, even when I was taking the beta blockers, I wasn't a huge fan of them because I think they were giving me quite low mood as well because they do they do just slow you down. Um, it was making me like really lethargic, but it was helping with the anxiety and panic. So it helped the initial start of my recovery, but then I came off them quite quickly because I thought, no, I actually, I want to recover through this sort of through your philosophy and making sure that it's more of just an experience that just flows instead of it being you know maybe like a I don't know how to explain it almost like giving myself a diagnosis of something you know it's just an experience and it'll come and it'll go um so I didn't want to give myself medication for too long um so that really helped but then I stopped them in start of October time um, and that's when I really saw the progress and it's so hard to do it when you're in the thick of anxiety but just get back to life like just get back to living um, you know even if that means going to the coffee shop and grabbing well I sort of I didn't drink coffee for ages um, getting a cup of tea or going to the shops and just doing a small food shop um you know just start you know even if you do feel uncomfortable just start getting back into life again because the more you sit around for me anyway the more I sat around and tried to think my way out of it just made it 10 times worse definitely yeah um and it's it's all about having the experience. You know, I wasn't much better at this point. You know, I was still, I still had DPD. I was still getting anxiety attacks. I still wasn't sleeping well. My diet was all over. But I just thought, screw you. You're not hold. You're not stopping me anymore. I'm. You know, I just need to get on with it. And actually, the more you get on with life, you know, it only starts off with it being like tiny, tiny little things. 
But at the end of the day, you'll sit back and go, oh my goodness, I got in the car for 10 minutes and I didn't feel anxious at all. Um, or I went to the supermarket and I had a conversation with a stranger and you notice all these tiny things and you think, oh, there might be a chance I'm coming back here. And then those experiences just build up and up and up and up. And you realize that actually the more you just let anxiety and panic be there and you just carry on, it sort of, I almost imagine it like, um, but like a, like spoiled toddler, you know, it just gets bored of you. So it sort of just starts leaving you. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and that's what I've been doing really that I went, I went back to work. Um, yeah, we've been getting, um, my boyfriend and I have been getting away for like weekends away. Um, I'm driving now. Uh, last weekend, I did four hours driving in one day, you know, on motorways and on dual carriageways. Um, no feelings of anxiety. I actually enjoyed it. Made sure I had like a good hot chocolate, got some good music on, you know, and yeah, really enjoyed it. So, you know, it's one of those things if I could go back to myself in June time and go, this is where we can get to and it's still going to get better from here, I would have told myself to just swerve because I never would have believed I could be normal again, if that makes sense. Um, but no, definitely, like, I'm going away next week on a skiing trip. Um, there is some thoughts of oh what if this happens what and you you do still get caught up in yourself I'd still say I'm still in recovery um but you just have to let those moments and those sort of what if thoughts just go whatever because I can do it you know I've I've been through the hardest part of my life and if I can get through that you know I can get through just an odd thought or an odd anxious moment, absolutely no problem. So, yeah, sorry, I've sort of like summarised all of that in quite quickly, but just want to get people to get a bit of a picture, really. Oh, you have nothing to be sorry about. It was perfect. I, I think mm. it's so wonderful because I love... I love that you gave the full picture of to where you are, where you were in June and it's just February, you know, and I know for mm. some people who, who knows what they would think, wow, that's so short to ha go from a feeling really, really anxious, really panicky, a lot of derealization and depersonalization to now February to enjoying driving. Because I think some mm. people, it doesn't even seem possible that they would ever enjoy something again. No. Well, you know, where you're like for four hours and enjoy it. And I don't, I think it took me longer to enjoy driving and there's not, there's not, oh, this is how long it should take, or this is how long I just loved it all. You know, um, oh, there was something, um, there were so many great parts about that. And I, that's what I love these stories of hope, because I think so many people, they might be saying, well, she wasn't as bad as me, you know, but mm. I, times when you, if they listen to the beginning of it, and that's a really common thing. I do want to say a lot of times people, they think that even that their experience must be worse. Did you ever feel like that when you would hear maybe my story or other people's story? It was like, well, she might recover, but I'm worse off. This is a worse experience. Cause I, and you really, you said it wasn't that, what if I lose my mind? It was like, I've lost my mind. You know, when you were having mm -hmm. so much panic and you had to take time off work, um, and it doesn't need to be a competition, but I want people to, you know, that this experience is possible for everybody that's listening and everybody that's watching. Yeah. Oh, no, there was definitely a point, like even watching your videos, I was still going, no, I don't think Lily's actually had it as bad as I'm having it. There was definitely moments. Um, and I think going back to the memories apps as well, like where I'd wake up and like, I wouldn't be able to remember my boyfriend's name. Um, I felt like I didn't fully recognize my family. Um, of course, I knew who these people were, but it's sort of that that horrible fog that DPDR just puts in front of you. Um, and there wasn't a lot of 
videos about that, that people are getting these memories apps. Um, and that's something that really panicked me because people were talking about DPDR and they weren't talking about these memories apps or, you know, memory loss for these few moments. And I'm thinking, yeah, there's something else going on here. Definitely. Yeah. Looking back, yeah. what do you, is it, does it feel like, oh, that was, you know, do you ever get memories apps now? Or what do you, what do you wish, what do you wish you would have heard if you were watching this podcast and, and somebody would have been enough just to hear, oh, I had these memories apps and, um, and they were just I think response. The, the hard thing with mental health and when you're going through mental health problems is it's just not the same for everyone. And, you know, there is going to be things that people experience that may not be very heard of, but that doesn't mean that you're, and it's not nice to say you're not new yet unique, mm -hmm. but when I think when you're going through a bit of a mental health crisis, it is nice to hear you're not that unique. You know, everybody goes through these experiences. And I think there's still a huge stigma about mental health that, you know, I didn't feel comfortable going to other people and go, do you forget your partner's name every now and again? Do you forget what reality is? You know, I didn't have the nerve to say that. Whereas I think if it was a, a lot more open, these things would be discussed. Um, oh, and another thing I really struggled with was um, I had a brief moment with um, like phobias of going outside. Um, so I actually spent two weeks, like the thought of outside and the thought of the sky literally would put me in a panic attack. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think you spoke that, spoke about that very much either. Um, mm -hmm. and it, I think, I think anxiety can just go so many different ways. It can go to DPDR and it can go to phobias. It can go to more panic attacks. Um, it can lead to so much. And it just, it's so unique. It's no, it's not unique, but I think the symptoms are so varied that people think that they have something completely different and they're actually really severely ill. Um, when, and I hate this phrase because everyone would just say it to me, but it's just anxiety, but anxiety can feel like the biggest monster that's going to come and kill you. It really does. Yeah. Um, and I don't say that lightheartedly because, you know, there were some really, really dark times yeah. um, that I had. But, you know, anxiety can just be, yeah, a nightmare. And it can just give you so many awful symptoms. But at the end of the day, nobody's that unique because it's just, it is just anxiety. And actually there you know, looking back to my condition, you know, people can recover and you talk about recovering all the time. And actually we are in a great time at the minute where people are actually becoming more and more open with anxiety. And there's more and more things on the internet where people go, yeah, I didn't leave my house for four years and I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that. Now I'm traveling, I'm doing this and I'm living life again. So it's, it is completely possible for everyone. And I think that's just what people need to try and realize when they're going through the darkness of it, you know, anybody can recover really anyone. Yeah. I love that you said that. And also that's why I love that I'm doing this and having conversations with other people, because as you know, I always ask you, like, if I ever share anything, can I share this? Can I share this? Mm. Because one, yeah, everybody's experience is unique. And I didn't have memories apps and I didn't have the, I mean, sometimes I was afraid to, to, to leave it just because it felt scary. Um, but mm. I I've heard from a client who is, she's afraid of open spaces, you know, like it's certain, you know, going on a hike is terrifying for her, but she's okay going to certain places, you know? And so that's why I love having a conversation with you and having a conversation with other people. So everybody gets to, to hear all of the weird and wonderful ways that mm. anxiety can manifest because yes, it, it is anxiety, but when we can, because we've been through it, we can say 
it's, it's not how I would say it. Like our thinking gets so distorted, but we feel it with all of our senses. Like it feels uh, yeah. so true. It's, it's like a full mm. body and mind experience. Yeah. So yeah. when I ever say what's behind anxiety is thought, I'm not being like, oh, it's just a thought. Like, no, it feels real. It feels incredibly mm. real. And I think yeah. there's the physical symptoms and you and I both mm. experienced a lot of mental symptoms, which mm. can be incredibly scary. Um, it can really, really mm. feel like I have lost my mind or I have lost my memory or, uh, yeah. and then we can, you know, feel incredibly hopeless because we can think this is, must be more than anxiety. You know, I think that's what I felt because when I was, I had a diagnosis mm. of generalized anxiety disorder and then panic disorder. But for me, it was mm. the combination of the derealization and depersonalization and also more of like the OCD, just like constant obsessing. Yeah. Felt. I oh, was, the thoughts it were... like it felt yeah. so so fast moving, so giant. Like as you said, it was. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when I would read on paper, generalized anxiety disorder, even panic disorder, I'm like, I'm crazy, and and like you yeah. know, I'm different, and and it was hard for me to put into words. And I think mm -hmm. until really coming into the three principles conversation, and when I met Sari, and then I would hear from Nicola, you know, and hearing certain stories, I was like. Oh, I could, I was like, oh, I'm not broken. I'm not unique in the best way. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, theirs was just as bad as mine. And that was, yeah. that was what I needed to hear. I think to put me on the road to recovery mm -hmm. one, because it stopped my brain, I think from adding on that extra freak out of the experience, but then, oh my God, this is so bad. Um, yeah. You know, and that's why yeah. I love that you're sharing your story of hope of where you are just a couple months later. Um, mm. You know, and I remember when it was a couple months and you had gone out of town, hopefully that's okay for me to, to share. Yeah, cool. Yeah, Cause, absolutely. Yeah. Cause you know, I always want to respect anything that you've shared that I think for some people, when we are having a mental health crisis, it can feel really scary to stay up late or to do things, you know, just to kind of freely live our life. And I felt like that was when it started to turn the corner for you was you, you know, yeah. you, your boyfriend and his family until like midnight and, and it yeah. started um, maybe like GPDR not to be front page news. And that was where you were, mm -hmm. even though you weren't feeling a hundred percent, it kind of started going in a different direction where you stayed up late and you were like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm fine. And and that kind yeah. of that momentum of I'm okay, I'm okay, and like kind of going back to normal. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that was that was such a break. I think it was yeah, it was a huge breaking point because that it made me get in touch with you and go, Lily, I've done this, and I was so pleased with myself. And yeah, I, thinking back to that memory now, you know, the DPDR was still pretty strong. I still felt quite out of touch from, with myself. You know very robotic and you know the, the real world still didn't make a hundred percent sense to me um you know I can I can sort of visualize that now but it, it is that breaking point of going well you know and try not to make it sound as big now I know that sounds not the best um and someone might be watching that going how can it not be big? This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I, yeah, I really get it. I really, really get it. But I think the breaking point was going, but I feel, I feel woozy right now, but I'm going to do this. And you still feel rubbish doing it. But I'm, I was more focused on going, well, I've just spent the last four months sat thinking about this. I'm pretty sick of this. So I'm going to do this instead now. And it's that breaking point of you almost get so fed up with it that you're just going to live your life with it anyway. But I think that really is the the shift into recovery. It's just going, I've got this, I'm experiencing this, but I'm going to carry on because I don't have time for this anymore. And I think that's a huge turning point for a lot of people. Yeah, yes. I love that. And I also, you had said, I think a, a little bit ago, that you couldn't think your way out of it, you know, because sometimes when it feels so big, it's like, oh, okay, I gotta, you know, stay at home and I'm gonna think about this. And and it, and it, yeah. what I love is you had an insight. That was this realization that was like, 
I'm going to live my life. And I, if I was going to feel better thinking about it, I would. And now I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to live my life, you know? And mm -hmm. I think I've had a lot of people, I had someone who I just talked to a couple weeks ago and he had that huge insight and it was a big realization for him where he realized until then he thought he needed to think his way out of, of anxiety, of depersonalization. Mm -hmm. And he had experienced it actually for a year and a half. But when he had this insight, yeah. he's like, oh my gosh, I don't think I experienced DPDR for a year and a half. He said, I think it was the fig trying to figure it out. It was me thinking about it and me checking on it. And so it wasn't mm -hmm. actually the DPDR. It was, it, even though it was, but he really saw how clearly he's like, wait, I can just feel this. Um, yeah. And that's what I love. Everybody has their own insights, you know, and it's because we can't have someone else's insights. It's when it feels really true to us, but there's people mm -hmm. that have common insight, you know, and I felt like when you were, you both realized the fluidity of feelings, because actually when we're trying to think about it, often it stays longer, you know, but when it's like, oh, yeah. when we start to understand the human experience, we can see that it's just an experience that's temporary. And with anxiety and DPDR, it can feel really distorted, but it's mm -hmm. distorted it's temporary and it changes all on its own. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Is there anything that, you know, you, you felt like was, was help also, if you're open to it, I know you said that some of the, the sticky notes that you have of one, I'm not an anxious person, which actually I agree mm -hmm. with, but sometimes people say, Oh, us anxious people. I'm like, I'm not anxious. Who are you talking to? Like, um, yeah, they say that comment often on Instagram, us anxious people. And I don't identify mm. as an anxious person. The thing is, there's nothing wrong. If someone's like, I'm an anxious person. Great. It's just a word, but mm. I sometimes experience anxiety, but I agree. Like I'm not an anxious person. I'm so yeah. I, I, I really identified with that one because until about five or six years, like six years ago, I was just like, oh, I'm an anxious person. And I felt like I had all this evidence. Yeah. I was always anxious, but I think mm -hmm. it, it was such a false story. Like, yeah. I'm I'm actually really not an anxious person. I'm not, mm -hmm. a, um, sure, maybe I have more anxious thinking than some other people, but I don't really experience much anxiety. But if you're open to it, share, would you, would you share, you know, you don't have to share them all again, but I thought that was really interesting. You know, I'm not an anxious person. And then maybe the second one you said was about love letters. Um, yeah, the second one is this is a love letter. So any negative experience now, um, I just go, this is a love, you know, this is a love letter. This is my body loving me, telling me something's not quite right. And if I think about it, you know, I'll probably realize well, yeah, I've stayed up and worked till eight o'clock every night this week. So yeah, I'm going to feel rubbish. And this is my body giving me a love letter going, stop working so much, <laughs> you know, or if I've started feeling um, like a bit poorly with just like a bug, um, because health anxiety used to be a huge thing for me as well. Um, I haven't touched up on that, but actually health anxiety, thinking back, I think I've, I think I suffered with the health anxiety since I was a kid, to be honest. Um, so anything at all really would just set me off. Um, and actually I was driving home from work today and I got this really sudden pounding headache in the side of my head. Um, and it sort of, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but if you've ever, ever had a headache so strong that it sort of makes your vision a little bit blurry yes yeah yeah now even a year ago well especially a year ago actually when I wasn't doing so well um that would have put me in an instant panic attack oh my goodness is this a stroke is this a brain tumor is that like my brain would just go a million miles an hour to the worst case scenario um where I was driving home and I had this sudden headache and I went right okay this is a love letter telling me something's wrong. Let's think about, okay, I've drank a cup of tea today and not really drank much water. I've been inside all day teaching on an interactive screen. You know, my eyes have been straining. Um, 
And actually, I think I've got a bit of a cold going on at the minute. And I was like, okay, I'm just not, you know, and it was within minutes. I was just like, well, this is it. Um, you know, when I thought that was a huge jump and I thought I need to mention that when I talked to Lily because for years, an experience like that would just make it go, make me go, yeah, I'm, have I got, you know, brain tumour? Is this a stroke? Is this something horribly, terribly wrong with me? Um, yeah. Whereas now I'm really seeing that freedom come into my life. Sorry, I went off on a tangent no, there. So I'll come back no. to the... Yeah, well, can, I, can you finish up on that? And then we can go back to, because, so I love that yeah. because to me, you're showing an example of, of how we just take care of ourselves in the most common sense way. Like, because you yeah. understand that, your thinking was clear. It was like, oh yeah, this makes sense. And so what'd you do? How did you take care of your headache? If you don't mind sharing. When you Well, I was driving home and I had a bottle of water in the car. So I just took a swig of water and actually it was still there for the duration of the drive. I was driving in the dark with cars coming at me with headlights on. Um, and then it remains a little bit when I first came home. Um, I just didn't think anything of it. I just thought it'll go when it goes. And if it lasts a bit longer, maybe I'll take some painkillers. Um, but actually it's gone. So, you know, it doesn't bother me. It's just your body does random things sometimes. So it it, yeah. really, it does, you know, and I'll say this and then I'll pass it back to you. I, I just went to the doctor and I was eating. I, I was like, I used to be really into eggplant. So I made this eggplant and cabbage and I was eating it in the car and the doctor was close. Um, and then suddenly I'm like, I think I might throw up. Mm. Uh, and I'm, it was like, this was just like two hours ago. So I'm still like, yeah. and it was so strange. I just pulled over and I thought, this is so weird. Um, and I just opened mm. it and then I was like gagging and I apologize for anybody. And I threw up and then, um, and I was thinking, and I thought, well, I got to call the doctor because my appointment was like in two minutes and I was outside the office mm. and I didn't know if I was going to keep going, but I had no, didn't need to make sense. Like, cause part of me is like, oh, was it what I ate? I literally just mm. ate it like, mm. I don't know. And I called them and I told them and I was like, I don't know if you don't want me to come in. I don't know if I'm sick. Um, and, and they were like, well, come in it, actually. And then I thought it kind of was passing and it was the strange mm. thing. And I thought, I think I can come in. Um, yeah. and so I said, okay, I'm going <laughs> Um, and I was a little nauseous for the hour, um, and I, but it was before I would have, you know, canceled us talking, canceled the rest of my day. I would have just mm. made it such a giant deal. Um, and who knows yeah. six years ago, it would have been like, oh my, I'm sure I would have been like, am I dying? And like, let me think about my diet and what's going on. Yeah. I don't know. I just got a little bit sick. I threw up, I moved on with my day. <laughs> like I actually, yeah. it was kind of, um, just as you said about the headache, it's like, we can, Sometimes it makes sense. There's the answer. Oh, I just had a cup of tea. I haven't drank much. I was teaching, you know, with a screen. Oh, that's simple. And you just have this feeling it will go away. It, it's like, it's so simple and common sense. And I think mm -hmm. everybody has that common sense in them, this wisdom, this yeah. common sense. And the thing is, when we get really anxious, as you said, it's like just catastrophic thinking. We just get so shaken up. Yeah, and you can't see it. Mm. Yeah, you can't, but it, it's there. And it's like, Oh, you know, and I just love that story because it's like life happens. Sometimes you get a headache, you throw up, you, and mm. as you said, you still drove home and there also, it wouldn't have been a big deal if you decided not to drive home. But what I've seen for me is when we don't get so scared and have this big overreaction, we can have a headache, but we can still drive home or we can throw up and be yeah. a bit nauseous or nauseated, but we can still go mm. and do something because we don't yeah. have a second layer of like anxiety. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah. And I think that's what people really struggle with is they sort of get stuck in that storm of anxiety, which just tells you the most ridiculous things. Um, and it's just, yeah, absolutely ridiculous. And things that don't even seem real that you start believing. Um, yeah. But when that starts dropping and that clarity starts seeping back through, it's just, it's just lovely. Yeah. It really is wonderful. Yeah. So the um, little mantras I've got, I wasn't actually, I've never been a mantra person. Um, this is something I've picked up in the last year. And when I first did it, I 
did like really generic ones like um I love my life and I love um I am beautiful and things like that but it just wasn't things that were quite resonating with me and I just felt they were so general um whereas now this is quite personal to me but I'm more than happy to share them um so the first one is I'm not an anxious person number two uh this is a love letter number three because I like the I'm not an anxious person I did suffer with depression I am not a depressed person um number four was this is um this feeling is a cloud so I like to visualize sort of more negative feelings as just a bit of a gray cloud you know it's not necessarily attached to me it's just something that comes by but then as it comes by it will also disappear um and then what's I'm trying to think of my list now um and then I've got one that is oh that was it um which I really like is I'm grateful for everything I've experienced so being grateful for what I've been through in terms of anxiety and panic and I know some people listen to that go how on earth can you be grateful this is the worst thing that has <clears throat> ever happened um but it's just been a huge wake-up call really has it's I think I've been I think I mentioned it in a comment I gave you a few months ago where it's made me realize that I was living life just sort of as if it was just lukewarm water you know I, I enjoyed it and I was having a good time but going through this huge shake-up I'm now coming out of it with more clarity and more ease and everything just feels so much richer now. And I'm not even scared of it happening again because I know that I survived it the last time and if it comes again, well, I know I'll get through it. And it's the same with any other situations. You know, I had a huge fear around death for quite a long time, um, which I think where the health anxiety linked, you know, ultimately it was a death anxiety. Um, you know, and whatever comes my way, I will handle it because I've been through the hardest time of my life um, and still came out the other side. So, you know, I'll just, I'll just deal with life when, when it comes like my headache tonight, I'll just, I'll just deal with it. Um, but it doesn't scare me. It doesn't worry me at all. Mm. Yeah. And I am, yeah, really starting to feel grateful for, when anxiety first knocked on my door four years ago and the huge shake up I had last year where I really thought this is this is it I've I've lost touch with reality I'm I'm gone um it's just all pointed me in a better direction on how to live life more meaningfully definitely mm. I love yeah. that I I too am grateful because I I felt the same mm. it was it was, you know, before I had my giant, you know, experience with DPDR and everything or felt giant. I wasn't in a great place before then either. You know, mm. it, it was my own version of lukewarm. I was so anxious and such a warrior, you know, and mm. so it wasn't as horrible and scary as my period of DPDR, but it wasn't as carefree and, and like, yeah, it just, I, yeah. I enjoy, I feel I feel calmer and safer than I did as a child, you know, and I'm, yeah. so great, yeah. you know, and I'm, I do don't fear. I don't, I don't want anyone I love to die. I want all everybody to live peacefully until they're 105, but I also know, mm. Hey, you know, and through this understanding, I just know I can handle anything, you know? So if I get health tests, like I just did some tests and people are like, well, how do you handle the anxiety of it? And it's just with this understanding that I've, I know I can handle anything. So I don't even do a technique. It's just, I'm so rock solid in, even if yeah. I hang out at first, mm. like I'm, I'm just, I'm so solid in yeah. my capability, I think, because yeah, it's like, I went through the hardest time in my life. Um, mm. and I just see how resilient human beings are, you know, and I think I've also had the privilege of getting to talk to 
so many human beings. And if there's ever a time when I doubt myself, it's like my brain shows me the evidence of all these amazing humans. And it's like, you think you're not a human too, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I just, I loved everything that you've shared. I can't thank you enough. No, thank you for um, taking the time really. It was, it feels a bit of a pivotal moment because going through anxiety panic, you know, I recommend people don't just sit on YouTube and Google anxiety and panic because that just adds to this catastrophic thinking that you've already got. Um, but sometimes you just need reassurance. Um, and it did, I remember sitting back and going, I wonder if I'll ever be able to <laughs> be one of these stories one day. Um, so yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit um, surreal for me really going, oh, I'm here now. <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. You are. Uh, but no, mass massive pleasure. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, yeah, I'm still... I still enjoy watching all your reels and your videos, but what's, what's great now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'll watch a reel and then I don't do it all the time because I don't want to, now that I'm sort of stepping back into life, I don't want to continue thinking about anxiety and DPDR all the time. Um, but if I come across a reel of yours and I see someone comment of Lily, I'm really struggling, you know, I've got this, this, and this, and this, um, it's so lovely to sit back and think ah, that was me that was me and uh, sometimes I even put the odd comment of going yeah I've had every single one of these symptoms you are not alone um and it's really nice for me to sit back and go yeah this person's going through a really horrible time but I've got full confidence that people can recover from this um so yeah, thank you to you for just creating the platform really. And you were my safe space for so long. You know, if I was in the middle of a panic attack, my partner would be going, well, try doing deep breathing and don't get me started on deep breathing. But um, I'd go, no, give me my phone. I need to see Lily with all the reels because that's my safe space. <laughs> so no, thank you so much because yeah, you you really were a huge part of it. Um, Even if you don't realize, yeah, huge part. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy that you're feeling good, you know, and I love it. Now, if you ever comment, you can say, and listen to my story of hope, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Go here. Yeah. people. Um, Cause it, it just is people have, I've gotten so much feedback when they love, when I share my story and, but my story is just my story, you know, just as you said, mm -hmm. some people, it's like, well, she didn't mention brain zaps or memory zaps and she, you know, and the more stories we can get, the more people can identify. And it's like, to me, it's like that sigh of relief of mm -hmm. see ourselves. And if we can see ourselves when they were struggling, we can also see ourselves when you're healing. Um, and that's really why I wanted to create this because I think oh, for a lot of people, it, it can seem so giant. And sometimes people think what I share, um, like I haven't experienced it um, as severely mm -hmm. as um, yeah. And, and so therefore they can't hope this enjoying driving again, staying up late, not experiencing DPDR. It's like, well, that's not, I don't know, you know, that's not possible for me. And so I really am just so grateful for you that you mm -hmm. have this conversation. And I, I know it's going to be so helpful because it just is, it's just such, such an inspiration, you know? And I feel like when you had that really scary night to me, then it was pretty quick that it turned, you know, like it was like, yeah you know it was like mm -hmm. you would watch some of my courses we had had a conversation and then it was like ah and then it was suddenly like very fast had started to to turn the other way too you know yeah I don't I, I don't know what happened well that it was two days after that that I went to the doctors um and I think that's when I sort of reached a bit of a crisis point and I actually just started opening up about my experience because I really really thought I was in a really lost and bad place like I could envision my like I have no nothing against people that need to go to a mental health hospital. Um, I definitely considered it. Um, but I had this like it sounds so horrible because I had this idea that because of the state I'm in and those panic attacks I was having, you know, it was very old fashioned how I thought I'm, I thought men are gonna come in come in and put me in straight jackets and label me a lunatic. And it was this really old fashioned thinking where that doesn't really exist anymore um, at all. 
So, and I think it's because I could visualize myself in that situation. I just started going out to a lot of people going, you know, I need help, please help me. And I think because I felt like I got a bigger community. Yeah. I think that was a huge part of it. Mm. I'm so happy you got help. And my, I had a very old fashioned version of it too. I pictured straight mm-hmm. jacket and then yeah. me just insanity and no return. I was like, Oh my God, yeah. I'm going to be locked up. I can't be a school. I, I, I thought that if I went to a mental hospital, which seems crazy to me now, like mm. where I was thinking, that's where it shows how distorted our thinking is because yeah, I know Sari and Nicola both went to a hospital when their mental health got so severe. I have so many clients that I've known that have gotten help at a mental hospital who are amazing and they go back to their lives. And, but for me, I thought that I couldn't be a parent after that. I thought they would be like, you you know, parenting, Mm -hmm. you know, so, so wrong, but that's when, Mm -hmm. when we're really anxious, our thinking's off, you know, like it's clear thinking, um, but yeah, but because we're picturing it in our mind. So I love that you got help. And I love, I, I just, I loved everything about your story. And I'm so grateful that you took the time to share this. Yeah. No, thank you, Lily. It's been, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, so lovely to get to yeah. see you. And also I want, <laughs> anytime you want to unfollow me and you're like, anxiety is totally in the past. I give you, I mean, obviously you don't need my permission, but I will not be offended at all when, yeah. you, when you move on and follow all your hobbies and interests Mm -hmm. well I I have already started doing that because I followed like so many pages um and actually I have got rid of most of them but I just there's just something about your videos you're just so positive and like-hearted with it all that I don't know it just I don't know I think you're still that sort of little safe place for me if that makes any sense um not that I need it at all um but I think because you were such a pivotal part of my recovery um yeah I don't want to sort of I don't think I'll be unfollowing you for a while just because I really enjoy your content um oh. but yeah I have I have started doing that I've started getting rid of and follow unfollowing certain pages on YouTube yeah um, because I just don't feel like I need to be absorbed in all of that now yeah mm. And it sounds like you did it naturally. You know, I used to follow when I was like healing from eating disorders and did it, like I, you know, followed so many people on that. And then slowly mm-hmm. I followed, but there's a handful of people that I just love. And even though I don't need all their posts, like there's a couple yeah. in terms of like exercise, like, you know, positive relationships with exercise and food in your body that like, yeah. and it, and it's actually like, it's, there's some people that I've followed for like 10 years, you know, when I first was really mm-hmm heal all of that, that I just love so much. And I don't, I'll never unfollow them, but it wasn't, um, yeah. Well, I'm so, I'm so grateful for you and I'm, I'm happy you're following me just cause then we can, we can stay connected. I always love, yeah. I love yeah. you. So thank you again. No, thank you. Um, sorry, we've gone over 15 minutes. I haven't seen the time. But, uh, okay. I, always, I, I keep an hour. Um, I, first I was, making them too short. And I, I was like, oh, I want us to be able to go over. So I'm great with this time. And, and it was such okay. a- Okay, amazing. Okay. Lovely. Oh, well, thank you, Lily. Okay. Yeah. Okay, bye. I'll see you later. See you bye. Later.